Happy Yule and Merry Christmas to all of my fiber junkies! Hey there, Fiber Junkies! Welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. If you are new, thank you so much for joining us, and if you're a returning viewer, welcome back. Uh, we are going to just do a super chillaxed uh, little podcast today, just talking about what I've been working on. So I am filming this uh, the week before Christmas, so we've still got um, just a few days left on Christmas knitting, holiday knitting, um, so the countdown is going. And if you celebrate Yule, which I do, it is a few days before Christmas even, so you have even less time if you're giving any Yule gifts this year or if you're celebrating Christmas early. Um, so leave me a comment below and let me know what holidays you celebrate this time of the year. Uh, so I know of ones like Hanukkah, Christmas, Yule, um, which is also the winter solstice, and uh, I think I, I I've heard of Kwanzaa, but I'm going to be really honest, I've been too lazy to Google it and figure out what it even is. Um, but I would love to know if you celebrate um, any of those traditions or something entirely different, even if it's something completely made up and nobody else celebrates it, it's your own private holiday, I would love for you to tell me about it. So leave me a comment below and let me know what you're celebrating this time of the year. And if you are doing any type of homemade or handmade craft or project for that holiday. It doesn't have to be knitting or fiber related, although it can be, like knitting Christmas gifts or crocheting ornaments or something. Um, or it can simply be something like I've talked about on my IGTV videos, which if you're not following me on Instagram, you should, and check out my IGTV channel. But on there, I talked about hand making a lot of my Christmas decorations and like ornaments for my tree this year. So if you're doing something like that, let me know because I love hearing about the handcrafting that all of my Fiber Junkie family is doing. So regardless of what holiday you're celebrating, what have you been working on? I wanted to show you guys some things that I've been working on over the last few weeks because I haven't checked in with my current projects. I, we've been talking about the wool series, returning to that with Icelandic wool, and then we were talking about um, some other more like how-to lessons and things, working on swatching and all those kinds of fun things. Um, so I wanted to share with you guys uh, one of the holiday gifts that I am working on, but I have to be really careful because some of my family and friends do watch this channel from time to time and I'm never sure if they're gonna watch the videos where I show off gifts that I'm making for them. <laughs> so I'm not gonna tell you who this is for, but I think you'll be able to figure out that it's not for me based on the size. Um, it is for someone that I care about, but it is not someone that I'm going to tell you about. I'll tell you after Christmas once they have their gift. But um, I actually I'm making similar things for several people this year on my list. And that is, can you guess what this is? It looks terrible right now, I know. Um, this is actually going to be a slipper. So I'm making um, hand knitted and felted slippers for several people on my gift list this year. So basically, if you've never done a felting project before, this is the first stage of it. Um, and I'm actually going to do a video on felting um, that will be coming out after Christmas. So um, I will be shooting it beforehand to show off these um, in process projects so you can see it at several stages, but it won't be debuting until after Christmas so you can see the finished result and I can tell you who got the Christmas gifts that I made this year because I'm not making something for everyone on the list this year, just, that's just too much for me. But I am making several pairs of these felted moccasins. So basically you knit it first and you knit it way bigger than you think you're gonna need it. Like I wear a size six and while these are not for me, mine would only be a little bit smaller than this. So um, you would make it way, way bigger, like for a ridiculous elephant giant person. And then you put it in the washing machine or you can hand felt it, but I'm gonna do the washing machine route, especially since I'm doing several pair. And um, you subject it to hot water and agitation with a little bit of soap. And the agitation combined with the temperature changes of water, like the dramatic shift from like room temperature to hot water suddenly on it and lots of agitation, causes the scales to enmesh on the wool and then it will turn into felt, which if you go to the craft store, you can buy sheets of felt or um, in the fabric aisle, if you have a sewing store, they will have like bolts of felted fabric that you can just cut and sew. And that's what a lot of people know as felt, but you can actually hand felt things either through knitting or crocheting and then felting down in the washing machine like I'm doing, 
or through um, differing like wet felting and needle felting and all these there's all these different types of felting that you can do but I am doing the old school knit a gargantuan object and then knit felt it down several sizes so that it will actually fit a real human's foot um, but I'm really nervous because I have felted projects before but it's been probably two years since my last felted project and to be perfectly honest, I have never felted anything that actually needed to fit like a garment. Um, so I have felted like handbags, totes, things like that, little um, like toys and stuff. I've never felted slippers or socks or, well, I have felted socks, but it was an accident. <laughs> So they came out like not at all like they were supposed to. Um, you do have to use non-superwash wool and non-man-made um, fibers. It has to be um, wool, mostly wool, uh, and if there's even just a little bit of acrylic in it, it won't felt. So I'm using 100% just rough, kind of scratchy, basic wool. Um, it's actually not very scratchy. For 100% bulky weight wool, this is actually pretty soft, um, but you can use the super scratchy stuff for felted projects because it will soften in the washing machine. And depending on what type you want, like if you're doing slippers like I'm doing that can be worn around the house or even outside if you put something waterproof on the bottom, you could use the really scratchy wool because you want it to be more durable and heavy and it's gonna be more of like an outerwear thing as opposed to like a scarf or a hat that you'd wear next to the skin. So, yeah, so I got my bulky weight 100% um, wool on Knit Picks, which is a really, really affordable way to do it. I actually looked at my, I was just going to buy some cheap patents wool at um, like Joanne or Hobby Lobby or Michaels or somewhere, and none of my area stores had what I was looking for in 100% wool that would felt that also had a wide range of colors. Like everything they had was like super pastel baby colors and like boring, boring gray, and that was it. So I wanted some different, like pretty jewel tones and things, so I ended up going to Knit Picks because they have a huge pattern palette of yarns and it was really only like barely like a few cents more expensive and if you order enough you get free shipping so it was a it, in the long run it was a much better deal and I got more of what I wanted um so I'm, I'm glad that I went that route so I will be back with a new video in another week or so to show you how those projects turn out and we'll actually go over how you felt things and I'll do some examples and um yeah, you can see how those turn out. Let's go on and show you the other things I've been working on. So I have two finished objects that are like finished with the knitting, but they're not finished finished because I haven't blocked them yet. So, and this one doesn't even have ends woven in yet. But I finished my Changing Staircases um, shawl, which is a free pattern on Ravelry. I will put a link below. And this is a really great shawl for using up just one single skein of hand-dyed yarn. It looks stunning and dramatic if you do it in a tonal or semi-solid or a solid yarn. It looks really, really gorgeous. And because of the simple stitches, it really works well for variegated skeins or like wild speckles. So I highly recommend that you use up some of your like crazy, like super deep, gorgeous colors, but like they're so wild and crazy of the color shifts that you're not sure what to do with it because, you know, cables or traditional lace would get lost in that. Um, this does have lace panels running all through it, but it is just a super simple eyelet lace. Um, so it really looks great even with a really variegated yarn. I'm using a variegated hand dyed yarn that I showed on the podcast recently. I purchased it um, a month ago at the East Texas Fiber Festival when I was there vending um, for potion yarns. I ran into another dyer which I'd never heard of before and I'm obsessed with her stuff. It's amazing. Um, called Chicken Coop Dye Works and I bought two skeins from her and one of them was a fingering weight uh, merino silk yarn which is what I used here and it was just so stunning. I loved these colors absolutely loved them they're called autumn leaves and I just I really thought it was like a subtle but beautiful fade of color and so I need to block this baby all up I did run out of yarn before I was done with the pattern um, one of my friends in my local yarn store knit this shawl this is she's who I found it from um, she had knit it in one of my hand dyed yarns but um, she knit it in a skein that had 438 yards per skein and so she was uh, actually able to add on an extra repeat or so and make her slightly larger and still had enough yarn I was using a skein of 400 yards and I thought that was close enough but I actually had to cut my last lace repeat short by several rows because I was playing yarn chicken hardcore and I decided it was fine. I couldn't get another skein of this anyways, and I was just gonna, I'm sure it'll open way up when I block it, because this one you have to pretty aggressively block um, to get it nice and opened up. 
And yeah, it's basically just stockinette and eyelet lace. So it's really simple, easy TV knitting. I took this with me a lot of places in social settings where I was like hanging out with friends and we're talking, but we're all just kind of sitting around drinking coffee or wine and talking. And so I would take this with me and be knitting on it while we're chatting because I didn't have to pay too much attention, but um, it was something for me to do to not just feel like kind of bored and restless. And I would often use it while in the waiting room at the doctor's office or the driver's license place or whatever. Um, so it's a really good, like portable, easy project because you memorize the pattern after the first repeat or so. It's really easy to memorize the pattern. And then you just kind of keep going until you run out of yarn or decide that you're done. So yeah, I can't wait to get that blocked up because it looks gorgeous. The colors are stunning and I can't wait to wear it. I love little shawlettes. And I actually used to be really into one skein shawlettes and then Lately, I have really gotten out of them because I find most of them really hard to wear because they're like too small to actually wrap around and really be able to wear. So I tend to prefer larger like one and a half to two skein shawls or bigger. And um, I've really been getting into like brioche and really, really dramatic um, color pooling and things like that. So I've been kind of sheer steering away from the like easy one skein shawlets. And so that was a really nice break for something just super easy, super chill, etc. Okay, the other thing that I finished but have not blocked yet, I'm really excited about, and it is the Mount Pleasant Top. This is a short little crop top, basically, and it looks very boxy and ugly just on its own, but it's absolutely stunning. I tried it on and it fits me perfectly. The idea is it's supposed to fit, um, you can make it a little bit larger if you want it even more loose, like a really, really modern drapey loose top. I wanted mine to be not quite a super fitted vintage top, but not quite the super, super drapey either because I'm I'm short and small, and if I have things that are too big and too loose, I get lost and I look a little silly. So I wanted this to fit uh, with just a barely, like an inch maybe two of positive ease over my boobs and then just hang nice and open and free and a lot of positive ease um, after that. So I was really happy with how this turned out because it's it hits just below your boobs and it's just like a real swingy little lace bottom edge. It's just a scallop like feather and fan type lace and um, really simple, easy lace, and then just stockinette, and then some ribbing, and the construction of this sweater is really, really easy. This is a super simple, super simple pattern. If you have not done garment knitting before, I highly recommend this one because it's easy. There's minimal sewing. You knit it in the round mostly, and then back and forth um, when you split for the sleeves and then rejoin it, and it's really easy. So there's basically no sewing, It's and you just pick up stitches around the armholes is probably the hardest thing if you've never done that, but it's it's easy, you can get it. And I love it. And it, the one I saw in the pattern picture look was just like a semi-solid hand dyed yarn. And I almost went that route because I loved how like classic and pretty and kind of rustic it was. But I had these two skeins of stunning hand dyed variegated sparkle yarn from my friend Cherish who owns Dandelions and Daisies. If you haven't checked out her yarn and fiber, she is phenomenal, also one of the sweetest people I know. And so I have these absolutely stunning skeins of her colorway, I'd Rather Be a Mermaid. And it's it's my colors, y'all. It's like teal and emeraldy green and like this rich magenta-y plum and purple. And yeah, it's stunning. And it's sparkle. So I wanted something really, really special. And this little top is just perfect. But um, I thought I could get away without blocking it. But honestly, it's not going to need an aggressive blocking. But the lace at the bottom is kind of like tight and crunchy. And I just want to spread it out just a little. And then I want to just kind of like smooth down this top ribbing for the neckline that's just a little like wrinkly. So I'm gonna um, go ahead and lightly block that and aggressively block my shawl and then those ones will be totally finished. Hi Phoebe, are you coming up here? Phoebe is coming to join us. I know she's everybody's favorite. Okay, so I wanted to also remind you guys that I am wearing hand knits today. Um, today has been like a run around and do Christmas shopping, go to the dentist, do, do boring errands kind of a day. Um, and it's really gray and like cold outside in Kansas City today. So I wanted to um, wear something warm and cozy and very casual and not have a lot of work put into my look today. So I am wearing one of my favorite old, old sweaters. Like I've had this for several years. This is my Drifts Ridge and I will put a link to that pattern below as well. It's a little hard to say, but it's drift like a snowdrift, 
um, Drift's Ridge, but that name really doesn't make sense to me, so I call mine that I knit um, Snow Drift because it looks like little snow drifting. Um, and I just use Jojo Land Ballad Super Simple Superwash Merino Bouncy Sock Yarn for the uh, yoke and cuffs, the color work that you do. It's just a plain white kind of cream color. And then the body is knit out of a local hand dyer here in Kansas City called Threadhead. Um, Mercy at Threadhead has been dyeing yarn for years and I've purchased a few of her skeins before I started dyeing my own, and this is just a really, really subtle semi-solid of brown. And it's really cool because she somehow managed to get um, really warm, soft, beigey browns mixed in with deeper, darker, cool-toned browns. So you get that perfect mix of cool and warm, and when seen from a distance, they all kind of like blend together because the color changes are so subtle. And it really just looks like the perfect neutral. It goes with literally everything, and it's a super good, casual, cozy, like Saturday run around, do errands kind of, or snuggle around with friends on a game night kind of a sweater. So I have worn it a ton. It's starting to pill a little bit because I knit it a few years ago back when I was just getting into sweater knitting in earnest and um, I kind of splurged on her yarn because I was also coming out of a period at that time when I had not been able to afford any nice yarn for years and this was kind of like a specialty splurge for myself to buy some of her hand dyed yarn and I knit a sweater out of it and I love it it's super cozy and then uh, my hat today I haven't worn this hat in a really long time but this is another super old knit like I've had for like eight years or something um, and this is basically just a little super slouchy hat and I just knit it out of cheap acrylic that I had left over in my stash they were actually leftovers from other projects um, so it's like a mustardy gold yellow on the bottom and then a little just plain white top and all 100% cheapo acrylic from like Hobby Lobby or somewhere and then I um, so I did these little owls out of you've probably seen these the you use cable stitches to make these little owl bodies and then you sew these tiny little super cheapo buttons that you can find at Hobby Lobby or Joann's on for the eyes so it's like really easy I don't have a pattern for this because I actually um, wrote the pattern myself and I don't remember where I found it, but I saw the little cabled owls, and um, I, I think I found a chart for a free chart online, like years and years ago, because um, I couldn't afford to buy patterns back then either. So I found a free pattern somewhere, but I never wrote it down, and I honestly can't tell you where I got the cable to make the owls, so I'm sorry that I can't give you more information, but that was like eight years ago, and I didn't think I'd ever need to tell anybody where I got my hat pattern from, and then I just, came up with the numbers myself and put in the cables for the little owls and did all the decreases myself. So it was completely like just intuitive cast on and go kind of a project. Um, other than stealing the cable panel from a free knitting pattern online somewhere. And I don't even think it was like a full pattern. I think it was like a blog somewhere where someone was like, here, everyone's doing these cabled owls and I charted my own design and here it is. You can put it in whatever you want. And then they showed it in like the yoke of a sweater or like on sock cuffs or on a baby blanket around the border or whatever. And so I just took the little single chart and put it in a hat pattern. But unfortunately, I don't remember where I got it. So sorry about that. Um, so that's what I'm wearing and that's what I finished. What am I actually working on still? I have two things to show you. I actually have more than that on um, the needles. I've got another pair of slippers I'm working on, which I'm almost done with. So I'll be felting those probably tomorrow or the next day. And then I've got two sweaters and a pair of socks, but we're just gonna look at the sweaters really quickly today. So the first thing I have looks like a baby garment because it has a lot of negative ease, first of all. So it is supposed to be super tight and it'll stretch over my bust. Also, it's in process and hasn't been blocked and it's cables which tend to draw in. But this is the Sweet Olive Sweater. It is a vintage style um, short sleeve or three quarter length depending on how much yarn you have and what you wanna do. Um, I'm thinking about making mine short sleeve although I might do elbow length, I'm not sure yet. But um, it's just a really cute little like fitted cropped pullover so it's one of those that's cropped at ends like around your belly button range or just below it doesn't go all the way down to your hip line um, and it's designed to be like vintage style so you wear it with high-waisted pants or high-waisted skirts and um, it's just like really cute and it's a very casual pattern you can dress it up with like a flippy little skirt and some heels and earrings and make it a little bit more fancy um, or you can wear it with just like jeans and flats or boots and stuff and make it very casual and kind of rustic. But it's got this really cute little cable panel right in the middle on both the front and the back. And then the rest is just stockinette and you start at the top and raglan shaping and then put the sleeves on holders, knit down to the bottom of the body, and then you go back and finish the sleeves. And I'm actually on the hem ribbing. You do do a pretty deep hem ribbing because it is a vintage style, but I'm almost done with the body and then I gotta go back and pick up the sleeves. This is taking me a hot minute though, because um, 
I did a gauge swatch for it on the recommended needle size, which I think is a four, and the fabric looked loose and sloppy and terrible, and um, I was way off on gauge, like way, way, way off. So I was like, I need to go down like multiple needle sizes. So I went down to a two and knit my gauge swatch, and here's the crazy thing. This has happened to me a lot lately, actually. Um, lately, I've been having this thing where if I knit a gauge swatch and it doesn't turn out the right size, and I'm like, I need to go up or down a needle size, even if I go down like two needles, like I did with this one, it only minimally shifts my number of my gauge, which is crazy. So I went from like maybe like six stitches to the inch to like six and a quarter stitches to the inch, and I was supposed to have like eight and a half or something. And I'm like, I went down two needle sizes. I'm not knitting an entire sweater on size zero needles. That's stupid. And so um, I liked the fabric a lot better on the size two than the size four. So I ended up choosing to go with that and just um, adjusting the size that I did. So I think instead of knitting like the medium that I was going to, I went down to a small number wise because I was still too big in my gauge swatch. So that way it should come out. I did the math and it should come out pretty close. And then there's a couple spots I jiggered the number slightly, but um, yeah, I kind of, I've had to do that a lot lately where I have to go up or down a whole size and a couple needle sizes in order to get close to the right gauge. And so then it feels weird because I'm knitting like the extra small and I'm like, there's no way my boobs can fit in that. But by the time I adjust with needle sizes and my personal gauge and all of that, it actually turns out that the extra small knits at my gauge to be the size medium or whatever it is. So, you know, all that crazy stuff that you have to do when you're making custom clothing. I know it's so hard, it's so hard, you guys. The struggle is real. First word, pro first world problems. Um, but I am really happy with how it's turning out. The beginning of this sweater was going slower than molasses, and I literally, I was having a hard time. I'm not gonna lie. I bought this pattern on Ravelry. I will put a link to it below. It is stunning and beautiful, and I think that her idea is fabulous. And I'm pretty sure the original designer, Anna Nielsen, I don't know if if English is her first language. Um, so it is translated into English. You don't have to worry about that. But every now and then I feel like things are explained in a really odd way where like technically the words are all grammatically correct, but it's just very, very an odd way to explain something. And so in the beginning, I was really struggling with the charts and the whole like increases for the raglan sleeves and stuff like that. It, it was really not making sense to me. And just the construction, the way she had done it, um, really was baffling my brain and it might have just been me I might just be a slow study because after I got going and I got probably three or four inches down the body I was like oh now I finally get it and I don't have to literally reread the chart and the instructions every single round which I was doing for the first three inches and on size two needles that is not any small amount of work so I was getting a little cranky about it um and I had to put it in time out for like a couple weeks while I did something else because I was just over it but and honestly, it's in timeout right now because I cast on a new sweater and I'm more excited about that. And it's bigger needles and bigger yarn. But I am really enjoying this and I'm getting so close now to the, the end of the body and then I just have a little bit on the sleeves that I'm, I'm thinking that I'm going to go ahead and redouble my efforts over Christmas to finish this baby. And I really like it. Now, um, I did try it on right after I split for the sleeves. The, that's the beauty of top-down sweaters. And it fits perfectly with the negative ease. I think I'm going to love it. The special thing about this sweater that I'm really excited to share with you guys is the yarn that I'm using. Um, this is a hand dyed yarn and this comes from a dyer called Kate Frank. Um, I believe her, I think it's called just, her company is just Catherine Frank Fiber Arts. I will look that up and put a link to her shop below, but I think it's just Catherine Frank Fiber Arts. Um, but last Christmas, I took part in a Secret Santa online yarn shop with some friends, and I'd never met Kate in person, but we were in the same kind of group of friends online that had similar interests, and um, so I was kind of getting to know her through the group, and we did this Secret Santa swap, and she got my name. And she, very sweetly, among several other lovely things like stitch markers and candy and stuff, she sent me two skeins of superwash merino and silk fingering weight in this gorgeous corally peach color because she had done some sleuthing unbeknownst to me and found out that while I love pretty much every color and my go-to colors are greens and teals all the time that I have a lot of green and teal already and last year when she was sleuthing around for some reason I got in this like coral kick which is funny because that's Pantone's color of 2019, but I got into it in 2017. Um, and I was like obsessed with this like corally peachy, like peach colors, any shade of peach and corally pinks. And I was like scouring 
everything for them, like home, home decor, dishes, yarn, everything. I was suddenly all about the peach and pink. And so she dyed me these gorgeous skeins and named them Joy, which is my middle name. And, uh, um, it's a part of my Facebook name, but my middle name is Joy. And so she dyed these beautiful skeins and called them Joy after me. So I got custom dyed yarn, you guys. Um, I don't know if this is something she has in her shop regularly or if she just made it for me. If she doesn't, she absolutely needs to because it is stunning. And as I am, like I loved it in the skein, but honestly, once I started knitting with it, I was like, oh my God, it's even prettier than I thought. Like I knew I was gonna love it, but I was having a hard time picking a pattern for it. And I hoarded it all year because I wanted the perfect thing for it. And I'm so glad I finally found this perfect little vintage sweater because with the shorter sleeves and the shorter body width, it's only going to take um, like the two skeins that she sent me. It's only 800 yards that I have. So, which is why I may need to go with shorty sleeves if I run out of yarn and I don't have enough for the elbow length sleeves, but I think I'm gonna just have enough because of the negative ease. But I love it, I can't wait to get it done. Okay, so the other thing I'm working on, I'm so excited. I can't wait for this to be done. I should have started it a couple months ago because I knew I was going to, but I didn't because I was just busy and whatnot. And, um, but it's a really, really cozy, warm, comfy, coat-like cardigan. Um, it's called a grandpa sweater type, you know, the really extra long, extra kind of bulky, lots of roomy ease. Um, it's a sweater that I've actually talked about on the podcast before because I was going to cast it on with some of my hand dyed yarn like back in the spring. And then the yarn that I chose, my Swamp Witch colorway, did not look good. Um, when I knit up the gauge swatch of the cable panel, it completely lost all the cables. And I didn't want to lose all the stunning cables because this the whole point of the sweater is the amazing cables all over it and the fact that it's big and long and cozy. So I decided I needed a quieter, more like subtle, neutral kind of colorway and I've been looking through my closet and realizing that I'm in desperate need of brown and beige sweaters. I have a lot of black, I have a few gray, not a lot, I could use more like gray and silver too, but I've got a lot of black and then I've got a lot of like red and pink and green and like bright colors that are very specific. I'm obsessed with mustard. I have several and I'm already thinking about casting on another mustard sweater because I just love them. But I didn't have a lot of brown and beige that are just good neutrals. So I cast on in my hand dyed yarn, the Opera Glasses colorway. This is one of my proudest colorways because when I first started dyeing yarn and to this day, I struggle with soft shades, white space and neutrals. I am really good at jewel tones, really, really bright saturated colors, really deep dark colors, and super busy speckles. And I think I am really good at neutrals when I do them well, but like I have to work really hard to not overload color into my skeins. A lot of times I start out thinking I'm going to make a pastel and then I get so excited in the midst of the process and just more dye goes in there before I know it. And I wake from the haze of the creative muse and suddenly my pastel has turned into a deep rich jewel tone. <laughs> So I have, I've really been challenging myself this last year to work on my pastel game and Opera Glasses came out I think not quite a year ago, like earlier this year, I don't remember when, but it was a huge triumph for me because I had never successfully done a light, super, super subtle pastel neutrally shade. And this is really perfect because it mixes beige, oyster, champagne, and pearl with a tiny little hint of super soft pink and it makes this absolutely stunning warm beige but it's so pretty and then it has like this super soft silver glaze over the top that gives it a hint of cool texture to like soften the warm tones so it really is like the perfect neutral so I dyed up a whole sweater quantity on my worsted weight my bombshell worsted which is what I am using for this sweater and if you saw last week's um podcast episode on swatching the swatch that I was using that had all the cable panel and then the stockinette at the top was the swatch for this sweater I actually have not yet unraveled that swatch. I pulled it off of the needles, but I did not unravel it yet, so it is still um, here. And I used this for the video because I was already knitting my swatch for my sweater anyways, so I figured I'd just go ahead and do the video on it. And um, I'm probably going to end up unraveling that, but I'm, I'm waiting to see how much yarn I can get away with using before I need to. But I absolutely am obsessed with my bombshell worsted, you guys. It's been on, in the shop since day one, and I tend to knit more with like fingerings and finer yarns, so I don't knit with the worsted weight as much. And I am absolutely obsessed with it. Every time I do knit with it, I fall back in love with it, and I'm like, why don't I have more things out of this? It's amazing. It's just seriously bouncy, 
seriously cushy and cozy, but it has amazing stitch definition. Look at these cables, y'all. This is incredible. These cables are stunning. It looks awesome in like bigger, heavier lace if you block it right. It's absolutely unbeatable in stockinette and garter stitch. I'm obsessed with it. Can you tell that I'm obsessed with it? So my one caveat with this cardigan, which I don't remember if I told you what it's called, but it is called I Am Groot. And it's this real woodsy, rustic, it looks like the, the cardigan you put on to go tramping through the woods on a fall day with crisp dry leaves under your feet and your tall boots and your apple cider and pumpkin spice latte. Um, it's amazing. But the one thing I'm having is, I do love that I Am Groot, the pattern, is written so thoroughly. Like, at every stage, she writes you like a paragraph to explain what's going on at the beginning. So if you're that person who needs to know ahead of time before you start doing something, that's great. I'm not one of those people. I'm one of those people that I want the schematic so I have like an, an idea of what I'm doing. But like, if you tell me the entire construction of the sweater in the first paragraph, I'm going to like start panicking or glaze over and be bored out of my mind. I would rather that you just give me the schematic give me the ease, the expected ease and measurements of the finished object and stuff and like all the information I need, like gauge and stuff, and then just throw it in and be like, okay, start on the back, cast on X number of stitches. I just wanna jump right in and do it. Um, but for those of you that like it, she gives you intense detail. For those of you that don't, you can skip over those parts like I'm doing and just get right to the meat of it. The good thing about that though, is there are a few parts where the construction is a little wonky and different than most sweaters that I'm used to in this style. So um, I really appreciate that she over explains everything because it, there were a couple points where I was like, now what the heck? And I had to reread the paragraph, the really, really wordy paragraph she wrote like, four times, but the fourth time I was like, oh, okay, this makes so much sense, thank you. And there were a couple of times where reading the directions up front, you know, it'd say like, you know, con continue doing the increase row every sixth row um, until you reach such and such point, or it is six inches long or whatever. And um, there would be, but there would also be a like, at the same time, do this thing. And I would get really confused, like, what am I doing here? And then at the bottom in parentheses, she'd be like, so you'll do this every this many rows, this every this many rows. And she just explains it like two or three different ways. So by the end of that whole paragraph, you're like, if you didn't understand the first way, you still have two more different shots at understanding what she's saying, and you're bound to figure it out. So my first thing, instinct when I read this pattern was this is a stinking long pattern it's like 13 pages or something stupid but it's because she writes a paragraph for each section of the sweater even just something super simple and originally I was like oh my god like this is not my first cardigan I do not need all this why do you have to over explain sometimes over explaining makes it harder for me to follow along than if you just give me the thing but after I got through the first section and I started doing the weird wonky like split for the front or the left and right fronts of the sweater and do these different cable panels, that part started getting real confusing and I was like, ha, huh, help. And I was super grateful at that point that she had like a whole paragraph gently explaining everything. And she writes just the way I imagine she probably talks things like, if you have an extra stitch, shh, it's okay. You're gonna be fine. Like she's so sweet. It's really, really helpful that she's so like engaging and she writes the way that you imagine someone just speaking to you at your local knit night being friendly and helping calm you down and calm your fears and help you get over the weird stuff so i would say it's a huge sweater if you've never knit a sweater before it's going to be a big like undertaking just because the sweater itself is huge it's like a sweater coat kind of a thing um that's why i love it i've been looking for one of these for my wardrobe for some time now but it's written so approachably and easily and she has lots and lots of um, charts and written instructions and lots of paragraphs explaining everything she explains everything almost over explains it to the point where I think a beginner could easily tackle this sweater as long as you go slowly and you take your time to do your gauge read through all the instructions I highly recommend I'm not the person who reads through the entire pattern before I start I'm just not. I know that's smart to do, but I'm really bad about that. And I usually don't even reread ahead like a paragraph or two. I just go line by line, and that's how I sometimes get messed up. But on this one, it really does, you don't have to read the whole thing up front unless you want to, but it really does behoove you to read each section before you start. And she breaks it up into easy, achievable sections. So, you know, it's like, okay, divide for the arms, and you have a little paragraph explaining it. 
then the actual stitch patterns, and then another paragraph explain, re-explaining it in a different way at the bottom. And it's just helpful to read through the whole thing before you jump into that because it will save you a lot of stress, especially if you're new. If you're an experienced knitter, you probably won't have any trouble with it. But if you're, if you're new to garments or you're scared at all about it, definitely just read through the sections before you cast on. However, it is a super cushy, cozy sweater. Um, it is built for an Aran weight yarn, which um, if you're not familiar, I've had a lot of questions about this recently at yarn shows, so I thought we'd just go over this. Aran weight and worsted weight are the same thing and not the same thing. So Aran weight is technically like a heavy worsted. It's on the thicker, bulkier side of the worsted weight category. Um, and then a light worsted is sometimes closer to a DK. Most places will just say like worsted weight. That's what I do with my bombshell worsted. It's just a worsted weight. Like it's not really, I don't consider it a light or a heavy. It's just like super, super medium to me. Um, it kind of depends on your gauge and what you're using it for. Um, but I was a little worried about the bombshell worsted, which was another reason that I swatched it because she specifically wrote it for an Aran weight yarn that was on the heavier side. And this one is really not on the heavier side. It's just right in the middle. However, after doing my swatch, I felt very, very confident that this is the appropriate weight for this. Most of the time you can substitute worsted weight for an Aran weight or vice versa. However, it is always smart when you're doing that to take in mind your stitch uh, patterns um, and whether or not the yarn is going to obscure that if it's a little heavier or a little lighter. And you also want to make sure you do your gauge swatch for sure. Um, but I was having no trouble. And you also, because this is more of like an Aran style with all the um, the cables and the, the stockinette panels next to seed stitch panels and things, you're going to be knitting it on a little bit smaller needle than you would normally use with a worsted weight. Um, so I am using the size 5 needle on mine, which is the recommended needle for her pattern. Um, you might need to go up or down a needle size depending on gauge, of course, but in general you're going to be knitting it on more of a needle that you would generally use more for like a DK weight than a worsted weight. So you have a bulkier yarn on tighter needles, which is going to make more of a firmer, closer knit fabric. So it's more of like a coat you can go outside in um, and like a heavier kind of cardigan. It's not going to be a light, airy cardigan. So I had no problem substituting the worsted weight for the Aran weight, but I would caution you if you have a light worsted, it might not quite work out. You may need to add some lace weight or fingering to it to make it that way. Um, if you have a bulky yarn, you could probably make it work, but you'll definitely want to swatch and you may need to rejigger. You just want to make sure that your bulky yarn isn't too bulky to obscure the cables and that you have the appropriate needle size to make those really, really pop. Okay. So that's what I've been working on. As I said, I'm also working on um, a super simple sock. It's basically a vanilla sock with a few slip stitches in it, but it's it's super easy, portable. I just, just take it with me everywhere. Um, but I'm so excited about it because this year's Secret Santa online swap that I did, I got my sock blockers finally. I know I should have just broken down and bought these like a year ago when I first wanted them. I asked for them last Christmas and no one got them for me. So I asked for them again this year. And I'm getting used to my family and friends generally being too scared to buy me fiber gifts anymore. Because now that I'm like professional, whatever that means, they never want to buy me yarn because they think, A, I have enough yarn. Silly, right? Like, no one has enough yarn ever. And just because my house is covered in yarn doesn't mean I get to knit with that yarn. Most of my yarn is in tightly sealed boxes and bags because it is inventory for my shop that is going to go to shows or go out the door for online sales and things. It's not like just like sitting around in my knitting basket that I can just dip into whenever I want. That's that's a common fallacy. People think once you start selling yarn out of your home that you have yarn whenever you want it. And technically you do, but at the same time, you don't you don't get to just knit with all that. So I never have enough yarn, but people think I do because they're silly, um, especially muggles who don't knit think that. Um, but also I think they get intimidated because they're like, oh, what if I, she has really fancy tastes now. What if I don't get her the right stuff? Or what if I don't get her enough to make what she wants to make? What if I don't get the right color? What if I don't get the right tools? And I say things like sock blockers and I can see their eyes glaze over and they're just like, what? So I'm really excited. This is why I do yarn swaps online with yarn minded friends because I can ask for things like sock blockers and cable needles and they're like, oh my God, I know exactly what you want and I've got the best idea. And they'll actually send it to you and they'll send you more yarn because they know that you need more yarn all the time. So I am so excited. Thank you to Jennifer, my uh, swap partner this year. She also sent a bunch of other things. I did an IGTV video of my unboxing, if you want to watch that. Me and my PJs unboxing um, from my yarn swap. Our Secret Santa opened early this year. But I'm not going to lie, even though she sent a lot of amazing things, which I am really excited about, my very favorite was the sock blockers, <laughs> even though they were only a small part of it. 
this is what I was most excited about. Also, I was pretty excited about some fabulous spinning fibers she sent me. I cannot wait to get my hands on it because it's merino and silk and I absolutely adore silk blends for spinning. It's like my favorite thing to spin. And um, it's absolutely gorgeous galaxy colors of blues and purples with like a silver sparkle through it. I mean, this girl nailed it on my colors like what I cannot wait to make yarn out of. I wish I was a better spinner so I could do it justice, but I'm just going to jump right in and learn on it in any ways and love it. Love my art yarn that I'm inevitably going to make. Um, so yeah, I can't wait for that, but I cannot wait to finish my socks. I'm, I just turned the heel of the second one of the pair I'm working on right now because I'm going to test out my new sock blockers with my socks very soon. So I hope you guys are getting your holiday crafting done really, really well. Um, I hope everything's going well for you and smoothly. Just a little piece of advice. I am terrible this time of the year about, I love Christmas and the holidays and I get so caught up in the excitement and I always wanna make every Christmas like super memorable. So I stress myself out trying to fit everything in. I wanna to go to every Christmas party. I want to buy gifts for everyone I've ever met or known. I wanna wrap gifts super cool, like an amazing artistic display instead of just pop it in a bag like most people. I wanna like do everything to the nines and I wanna hand knit everyone a gift, which doesn't ever end up happening, but I always think I can. Um, and then I have to run out last minute and buy gifts because I didn't get them all done. So please learn from my past mistakes. I'm working really hard this year on doing better and I think I'm doing a lot better this year than I normally do. But just a reminder that the holidays are about time spent. I actually had this major epiphany the other day. Um, I was stressing super hard because my business, my yarn business has slowed down a little bit this month for December. It usually does in December, which doesn't worry me because January usually picks right back up and is an amazing month for me. And I just came off of several amazing months in a row, lots of sales, lots of busyness to the point where I was almost too busy. And so I've kind of been enjoying the break and the downtime. It's still steadily trickling along, but it's not like insanity. I don't have any out of town shows to go to or anything this month. So I'm kind of enjoying the break, but I started panicking the other day because coming with the break, um, I had this major like lazy slump where I'm struggling to get motivated and I'm also really struggling to get clear on what my goals are for the new year. I hit so many of my personal goals this last year and then went above and beyond those goals that I wasn't expecting to do. And so now I'm kind of like, oh, well, I kind of like tackled a bunch of my goals already and now I need to come up with like New Year's goals for my business and I don't know what to focus on. And I feel like I have all these goals, but they're more like long-term goals down the road and I'm scared to set those goals now because I know I probably won't make them within the next year, so I don't wanna get all distressed out and all this all this stuff. So I started getting really stressed and I was also thinking about um, like spending time with our families. My husband and I were talking about trying to work in family time with all of our extended family and then which friends we wanna see over the holidays while he's home on business uh, before he has to go out again and like what I'm gonna do, like how much of work time am I gonna have over the holidays versus hanging out and spending time with him and our family. And I just broke down in tears and started freaking out that everyone was pressuring me. And then as we talked about it, I realized literally no one in our family or friends had put any pressure. In fact, every single person was like, no pressure, we just wanna see you, but we totally understand with Breck traveling a lot and you busy, we get it if you just wanna have Christmas alone or if you just wanna see us for like a couple hours and then go home or if you just wanna meet for a dinner out and then go home, like we get it, we don't wanna stress you out, we want you to relax. So everyone had gone out of their way to tell me not to stress and yet somehow I still turned it into everyone is stressing me out and everyone's putting pressure on me and expectations on me and it turned out it was just me. And so that was hugely relieving to realize, but then it followed immediately with this crazy, like, why do I do myself this to myself every year? I stress about making memories, and I realized as I was crying, I'm like bawling to my husband, and I'm like, I just want us to have like traditions that are like our thing we do as a couple every year, plus our family, like in-law traditions, and I just want to like have good Christmases that we look back on every year and we're like, man, Christmas is amazing. New Year's is amazing. Like we love the holidays and we look forward to this downtime and I don't want it to be stressful, but I also don't want it to be boring and we just don't do anything. And I realized thinking back, we, we started talking about like what made a good Christmas growing up because I said something about like, I want Christmas to be as special as it was for me when I was a kid, even though we're adults. And I started thinking about it and I realized that everything that I could list off that was a tradition we did like every year as a family at Christmas and New Year's, there was only one big party thing where we invited everyone into our home and like my mom went all out with like cooking and buying food and stuff and, and that was New Year's party every year and that was a big deal. But even that, it was like we had people over to like 
eat stuff and play games. That was literally it. There wasn't a huge plan. It was just like hanging. It was spending time with people. And all of our Christmas traditions that were really important to me were spending time as a family, usually not doing much, usually making hot chocolate and opening presents and like watching a Christmas movie on Christmas Eve or whatever it was, or like going caroling with our church or whatever it was that we did that year. There were, there were different things we did each year. And then there was just like our family time, but my favorite memories were just our immediate family at home in our PJs on Christmas Eve night, drinking cocoa and opening presents or watching a movie and opening presents the next morning. Like those were my favorite things. And so the common theme I realized with everything, sorry, this is really long, but I had this epiphany. The common thing I realized was time. The time together was what was important. And I know that this is not news for most of you. Probably most of you already figured this out, but I'm still young and stupid and learning. But I realized that I was stressing myself out to create this, to, to make or buy these amazing gifts and wrap them perfectly so they look like a magazine display and to like bake all these fancy British baking show goods, right? I'm not a good baker so I can't keep up with the British baking show but I'm obsessed with it so now I want all my holiday goods to be that perfect and fancy and I realized that I was stressing myself out and I was taking more time away trying to make all of the like accessories perfect instead of just being like hey guys I'm gonna show up in my PJs to your house but we're like gonna have a game night and hang out and have fun like or hey you can come over my house isn't perfect and we're having frozen pizza but I really want to see you can can you come over and guess what when I got off my high horse and did that and invited friends over for a really super cheap, simple, easy meal. No pressure, no stress. They immediately accepted. They came over. We had a blast hanging out and ended up having some really great talks about business and life and, you know, depression and all these other things we were working through. And we all went away that night being like, this was the most like unplanned, non fancy night ever. And it was amazing. And that's what I want my Christmas to be about. I want those moments where I get to really connect with people. I want to really talk to people. I want to really find out what people are celebrating and why. What what are your goals for the new year? What do you think I should work on and be better at? Like, what's your favorite Christmas movie? Like, let's just talk about everything and let's just be with each other. Let's just spend time together. Whether it's baking or crafting or shopping or cleaning or sleeping or whatever we're doing, let's just be together. So I really encourage you guys to take a deep breath this holiday season. Try not to stress about it. Going into this weekend, Christmas is coming up in just a few days, and this is the weekend for a lot of you. If you're like me, you're probably already celebrating Christmases with family or friends this weekend. So just try to like enjoy it, go into it with a great attitude, and focus on the time you can spend together. And I bet you will have a lot more memories at the end of it than if everything was pristine, perfect, magazine ready, and all of that. Nobody's gonna remember if you don't have a perfectly clean house. Nobody's going to remember what you ate or nobody's going to remember whether probably they won't even remember what you give them. Honestly, they're going to remember that you took the time to give them something or to spend with them or whatever. So please, please, please go make memories more than you make fancy, amazing Christmases. But I hope you have that too. So it is now time to cast off. I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful holiday, whatever you're celebrating. And if you're not celebrating any particular holiday, I still wish all the best for you hope and love and peace and warmth and lots and lots of crafting time this weekend. I hope you guys have a wonderful time. It is now time to cast off. Love you.